Chapter 6 Beast from Air There was no light left save that of the stars. When they had understood what made this ghostly noise and Percival was quiet again, Ralph and Simon picked him up unhandily and carried him to a shelter. Piggy hung about near for all his brave words, and the three bigger boys went together to the next shelter. They lay restlessly and noisily among the dry leaves, watching the patch of stars that was the opening toward the lagoon. Sometimes a little one cried out from the other shelters, and once a big one spoke in the dark. Then they too fell asleep. A sliver of moon rose over the horizon, hardly large enough to make a path of light, even when it sat right down on the water. But there were other lights in the sky that moved fast, winked, or went out, though not even a faint popping came down from the battle fought at ten miles' height. But a sign came down from the world of grown-ups, though at the time there was no child awake to read it. There was a sudden bright explosion and corkscrew trail across the sky, then darkness again, and stars. There was a speck above the island, a figure dropping swiftly beneath a parachute, a figure that hung with dangling limbs. The changing winds of various altitudes took the figure where they would. Then, three miles up, the wind steadied and bore it in a descending curve around the sky and swept it in a great slant across the reef and the lagoon toward the mountain. The figure fell and crumpled among the blue flowers of the mountainside. But now there was a gentle breeze at this height too, and the parachute flopped and banged and pulled. So the figure, with feet that dragged behind it, slid up the mountain. Yard by yard, puff by puff, the breeze hauled the figure through the blue flowers, over the boulders and red stones, till it lay huddled among the shattered rocks of the mountain top. Here the breeze was fitful and allowed the strings of a parachute to tangle and festoon, and the figure sat, its helmeted head between its knees, held by a complication of lines. When the breeze blew, the lines would strain taut, and some accident of this pull lifted the head and chest upright, so that the figure seemed to peer across the brow of the mountain. Then, each time the wind dropped, the lines would slacken, and the figure bow forward again sinking its head between its knees. So as the stars moved across the sky, the figure sat on the mountaintop and bowed and sank and bowed again. In the darkness of early morning, there were noises by a rock a little way down the side of the mountain. Two boys rolled out a pile of brushwood and dead leaves, two dim shadows talking sleepily to each other. They were the twins on duty at the fire. In theory, one should have been asleep and one on watch but they could never manage to do things sensibly if that meant acting independently. And since staying awake all night was impossible, they had both gone to sleep. Now they approached the darker smudge that had been the signal fire, yawning, rubbing their eyes, treading with practiced feet. When they reached it, they stopped yawning, and one ran quickly back for brushwood and leaves. The other knelt down. I believe it's out. He fiddled with the sticks that were pushed into his hands. No. He lay down and put his lips close to the smudge and blew softly. His face appeared, lit redly. He stopped blowing for a moment. Sam, give us tinderwood. Eric bent down and blew softly again till the patch was bright. Sam poked the piece of tinderwood into the hot spot, then a branch. The glow increased and the branch took fire. Sam piled on more branches. Don't burn the lot, said Eric. You're putting on too much. Let's warm up. We'll only have to fetch more wood. I'm cold. So am I. Besides, it's dark. All right, then. Eric squatted back and watched Sam make up the fire. He built a little tent of dead wood and the fire was safely alight. That was near. He'd have been waxy. Huh? For a few moments, the twins watched the fire in silence. Then Eric sniggered. Wasn't he waxy? About the fire and the pig. Lucky he went for Jack instead of us. Ha! Huh. Remember old Waxy at school? Boy, you're driving me slowly insane. The twins shared their identical laughter, then remembered the darkness and other things and glanced around uneasily. The flames, busy about the tent, drew their eyes back again. Eric watched the scurrying wood lice that were so frantically unable to avoid the flames and thought of the first fire, just down there on the steeper side of the mountain, where now was complete darkness. 
He did not like to remember it and looked away at the mountaintop. Warmth radiated now and beat pleasantly on them. Sam amused himself by fitting branches into the fire as closely as possible. Eric spread out his hands, searching for the distance at which the heat was just bearable. Idly looking beyond the fire, he resettled the scattered rocks from their flat shadows into daylight contours. Just there was the big rock, and the three stones there, that rock, and there beyond was a gap. Just there. Sam! Nothing. The flames were mastering the branches. The bark was curling and falling away, the wood exploding. The tent fell inwards and flung a wide circle of light over the mountaintop. Sam! Ah! Sam! Sam! Sam looked at Eric irritably. The intensity of Eric's gaze made the direction in which he looked terrible, for Sam had his back to it. He scrambled round the fire, squatted by Eric, and looked to see. They became motionless, gripped in each other's arms, four unwinking eyes aimed and two mouths open. Far beneath them, the trees of the forest sighed, then roared. The hair on their foreheads fluttered, and flames blew out sideways from the fire. Fifteen yards away from them came the plopping noise of fabric blown open. Neither of the boys screamed, but the grip of their arms tightened and their mouths grew peaked. For perhaps ten seconds they crouched like that while the flailing fire sent smoke and sparks and waves of inconstant light over the top of the mountain. Then, as though they had but one terrified mind between them, they scrambled away over the rocks and fled. Ralph was dreaming. He had fallen asleep after what seemed hours of tossing and turning noisily among the dry leaves. Even the sounds of nightmare from the other shelters no longer reached him, for he was back to where he came from, feeding the ponies with sugar over the garden wall. Then someone was shaking his arm, telling him that it was time for tea. Ralph, wake up! The leaves were roaring like the sea. Ralph, wake up! What's the matter? We saw the beast. Plain! Who are you? The twins? We saw the beast. Quiet. Piggy. The leaves were roaring still. Piggy bumped into him and a twin grabbed him as he made for the oblong of paling stars. You can't go out. It's horrible. Piggy, where are the spears? I can hear the... Quiet then. Lie still. They lay there listening, at first with doubt, but then with terror to the description the twins breathed at them between bouts of extreme silence. Soon the darkness was full of claws, full of the awful unknown and menace. An interminable dawn faded the stars out, and at last light, sad and gray, filtered into the shelter. They began to stir, though still the world outside the shelter was impossibly dangerous. The maze of the darkness sorted into near and far, and at the high point of the sky, the cloudlets were warmed with color. A single seabird flapped upwards with a hoarse cry that was echoed presently, and something squawked in the forest. Now streaks of cloud near the horizon began to glow rosily, and the feathery tops of the palms were green. Ralph knelt in the entrance to the shelter and peered cautiously around him. Sam and Eric, call them to an assembly, quietly. Go on. The twins, holding tremulously to each other, dared the few yards to the next shelter and spread the dreadful news. Ralph stood up and walked for the sake of dignity, though with his back pricking to the platform. Piggy and Simon followed him, and the other boys came sneaking after. Ralph took the conch from where it lay on the polished seat and held it to his lips, but then he hesitated and did not blow. He held the shell up instead and showed it to them, and they understood. The rays of the sun that were fanning upwards from below the horizon swung downwards to eye level. Ralph looked for a moment at the growing slice of gold that lit them from the right hand and seemed to make speech possible. The circle of boys before him bristled with hunting spears. He handed the conch to Eric, the nearest of the twins. We've seen the beast with our own eyes. No, we weren't asleep. Sam took up the story. By custom now, one conch did for both twins, for their substantial unity was recognized. It was furry. There was something moving behind its head. Wings. The beast moved, too. That was awful. It kind of sat up. The fire was bright. We just made it up. More sticks on. There were eyes. Teeth. Claws. We ran as fast as we could. Bashed into things. The beast followed us. I saw it slinking behind the trees. Nearly touched me. 
Ralph pointed fearfully at Eric's face, which was striped with scars where the bushes had torn him. How did you do that? Eric felt his face. I'm all rough. Am I baiting? The circle of boys shrank away in horror. Johnny, yawning still, burst into noisy tears and was slapped by Bill till he choked on them. The bright morning was full of threats, and the circle began to change. It faced out rather than in, and the spears of sharpened wood were like a fence. Jack called them back to the center. This will be a real hunt. Who will come? Ralph moved impatiently. These spears are made of wood. Don't be silly. Jack sneered at him. Frightened? Course I'm frightened. Who wouldn't be? He turned to the twins, yearning but hopeless. I suppose you aren't pulling our legs? The reply was too emphatic for anyone to doubt them, and Piggy took the conch. Couldn't we kind of stay here? Maybe the beasts won't come near us. But for the sense of something watching them, Ralph would have shouted at him. Stay here and be cramped into this bit of island, always on the lookout? How should we get our food? And what's about the fire? Let's be moving said Jack relentlessly. We're wasting time. No, we're not. What about the little ones? That sucks to the little ones. Someone's got to look after them. Nobody has so far. And there was no need. Now there is. Piggy will look after them. That's right. Keep Piggy out of danger. Have some sense. What can Piggy do with only one eye? The rest of the boys were looking from Jack to Ralph curiously. And another thing. You can't have an ordinary hunt because the beast doesn't leave tracks. If it did, you'd have seen them. For all we know, the beast may swing through the trees like what's-its-name. They nodded. So we've got to think. Piggy took off his damaged glasses and cleaned the remaining lens. How about us, Ralph? You haven't got the conch. Here. I mean, how about us? Suppose the beast comes when you're all away. I can't see proper, and if I get scared... Jack broke in contemptuously. You're always scared. I got the conch. Conch, conch, shouted Jack. We don't need the conch anymore. We know who ought to say things. What good did Simon do speaking, or Bill, or Walter? It's time some people knew they've got to keep quiet and leave deciding things to the rest of us. Ralph could no longer ignore his speech. The blood was hot in his cheeks. You haven't got the conch, he said. Sit down. Jack's face went so white that the freckles showed as clear brown flecks. He licked his lips and remained standing. This is a hunter's job. The rest of the boys watched intently. Piggy, finding himself uncomfortably embroiled, slid the conch to Ralph's knees and sat down. The silence grew oppressive, and Piggy held his breath. This is more than a hunter's job, said Ralph at last, because you can't track the beast, and don't you want to be rescued? He turned to the assembly. Don't you all want to be rescued? He looked back at Jack. I said before, the fire is the main thing. Now the fire must be out. The old exasperation saved him and gave him the energy to attack. Has anyone got any sense? You've got to relight that fire. You never thought of that, Jack, did you? Or don't any of you want to be rescued? Yes, they wanted to be rescued. There was no doubt about that. And with a violent swing to Ralph's side, the crisis passed. Piggy let out his breath with a gasp, reached for it again, and failed. He lay against a log, his mouth gaping, blue shadows creeping round his lips. Nobody minded him. Now think, Jack. Is there anywhere on the island you haven't been? Unwillingly, Jack answered. There's only... But, of course, you remember the tail end part, where the rocks are all piled up. I've been near there. The rock makes a sort of bridge. There's only one way up, and the thing must live there. All the assembly talked at once. Quite. All right. That's where we'll look. If the beast isn't there, we'll go up the mountain and look. And light the fire. Let's go. We'll eat first, then go. Ralph paused. We'd better take spears. After they had eaten, Ralph and the biggins set out along the beach. They left Piggy propped up on the pla- All right, guys, I'm going to leave it there for now. Enjoy your day. Read the rest of the text. Answer your, pro, uh, your questions on the packet. And I will see you guys soon. Tuning out, Mr. Jinx.